Hello. And welcome to an intro to Anthro with two humans. I'm human number one, John McCrae. And I'm human number two, John Lear. And this is the podcast where we reassess what it means to be human. And the title of today's episode is You Sasquatch My Back, All Sasquatch Yours, or Big Feet Make Big Footnotes. <laughs> so, so, John, Ooh, I, know, uh, I know you have a cold today. I know yes, you have a cold I, today. You're nursing you for, a cold. for that. Yes, I'm, I'm, everyone in Los Angeles seems to have some, something going on right now. And uh, I have a horrible head cold in the summer, which I can't... Nothing more pleasant than yeah. a head cold in the summer, hot summer with a cold. It's just yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you showing up. Oh, my God. Gutting it out and being yeah. here. I'm a professional. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you need to, to, just work. lay down, just take the headphones and the microphone and lay down on the ground. Do like a Jim Morrison down there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do uh, it. He also recorded in the bathroom. So maybe I, I can really? do that later. Yeah, too. yeah. Feel free. Not that I'm not having any stomach issues. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just to give you a little background on, on this topic for this, this episode, um, since COVID has ended and the lockdown's over, I've been driving to work a lot more. And mm -hmm. on my way to work every morning and on the way home, I've been noticing a lot more bumper stickers on cars featuring Sasquatch. I or the Bigfoot. Too. Yeah. What's the deal with Bigfoot? He's suddenly back? I I don't know. I mean, it's usually I'll see it and it will be a silhouette of Bigfoot and it will say something like, I believe. Or maybe sometimes I see like Bigfoot believes in me, you know, putting a twist uh, on it or something. That's nice. And yeah. And I know that uh, Bigfoot has been used to sell, uh, what was it? Jack Link's beef jerky. They had the mess oh. messing with Sasquatch. I bought the jerky just because of that. <laughs> know, me too. I love it. It's always like some, I, yeah, some guy like uh, making a, like doing a practical joke on Sasquatch and then yep. Sasquatch gets mad and slaps him or something like that. Yeah. But. Uh, and then I was at the hardware store recently and I was waiting in line and they were selling up near the checkout. They were selling Dr. Squatch men's hand soap. And apparently, what? yeah. And the illustration, the logo for it's Dr. Made Squatch. made out of dead Bigfoots? <laughs> I don't know. Like what? It's, uh, it's, it's a soap for mm -hmm. men. Okay. Made by the company's name is Dr. Squatch. And it's, has a, a drawing of a Sasquatch. He he's smoking a pipe, and he's wearing a tie, and he has like a robe on. He's kind of a Hugh Hefner-ish uh, Sasquatch, <laughs> a very elegant okay. looking Sasquatch. Love that. And then uh, Mary and I were going out to dinner not too long ago, and I was driving, and we were stopped at a light. Mary, by the way, is our. I'm sorry to interrupt, but is our senior yeah. VP of marketing <laughs> yeah, for Intro to Anthro. Right, she's just been brought on board. Yeah. She came up with these lovely mugs. Look at that coffee cup. Well done. Look at you doing product Look, placement right I when know. we mention it. Well done. The my swag. Friend. The swag. Nailed it. Nailed it. All right. So we were sitting at a light, and I glance over next to me at the car next to me, and it's a Ford Bronco, and there's a factory-installed emblem with a silhouette of Sasquatch, and it's what? a Sasquatch on it. And apparently the Sasquatch is a package, a custom package that you can get on your Ford Bronco. No uh, way. That's yeah. genius. God, it has a that. shorter drive ratio, Bill Stein shocks, locking front and rear axles, 17 that inch wheels, sense. and yeah, 35 so inch. Yeah. If you're if you're uh, if you're chasing Sasquatch, you need front and back axles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a 35 inch mud terrain tires. Which that's yeah. probably like the whole Sasquatch. Yeah, right that's there. it right there. You could run him over and not kill him <laughs> with that height. <laughs> but I was like, to me, John, that was my uh, deadhead sticker on the Cadillac moment. I was like, what the hell, man? It's like, I know. What won't Sasquatch shill at this point? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, what, what next? Is it going to be uh, reverse mortgages or something? It's just like Sasquatch is everywhere. Somebody just took that idea. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's a Bigfoot uh, bar, very famous bar nearby me uh, on Los Feliz Boulevard. Really? Uh huh. Oh. Yeah, it's a good bar too. It's quiet, dark. It's called Bigfoot. Is it themed with Bigfoot? Oh, yeah. Inside? All, all. Oh, man. Yeah. I've always hoped to take you there someday because I know what yeah. a fan you are. Now, before you get dive in, and I know you, this is probably annoying, but just for those of us, the lay people, explain how Bigfoot fits into anthropology because he's a missing, a possible missing link. Yeah, he I, to me. Well, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. If he's a bipedal primate mm. that still exists in North America then he definitely fits into physical anthropology the same as any other bipedal primate would be like an Australopithecus afarensis mm-hmm. or a, uh, uh, any, any of the other Homo erectus, right. any of those others. <coughs> that one. <laughs> right. Every I time. I was holding back. I didn't want to say it, but I do. Uh, <laughs> Got it. The other way he fits in is from a uh, folklore standpoint. Yes. And yes. so as anthropology also includes folklore, then he's also all the belief systems that go with uh, Bigfoot or all the legends of Bigfoot also mm. fit within cultural anthropology. Yes. Because so. we don't want, we don't like the idea that we're all alone yeah. out there. Don't you think? I, mean, I think so. But, yeah. And that, that has a little bit to do with it. Like here's some cousins. Yeah. Cause they're the, still uh, out there. Yeah. It's not mm-hmm. quite, we don't know everything. I think that's yes. what we like. Yeah. To know. Boy. Um, ain't, that the case, ain't, that the, ain't that the truth? So, <laughs> but, the cold but the point is, is kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> John's been tooting up with some uh, nasal spray. Uh, I, like that's all I have from. left. I quit yeah. everything. I've been sober for so long. <laughs> all I got left is, uh, you know, anti uh, nose drops and yeah. cough drops. That's it. Just leave it up there in your nose. I yeah, mean, just, just leave it up in your nose. Just put the thing care. up here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank just you. Leave it there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, all of this to me, like you were saying, it's Bigfoot is everywhere now. Yeah. And I'm like, he's more popular and ubiquitous than he's ever been. I agree. I, think. I agree. Yeah. And you know, back in the 70s, there was uh Leonard Nimoy's in search of and they would always do something on Bigfoot. Right. Uh, then there was Unsolved Mysteries, and they would always do something on Bigfoot. Right. And and then now we have even other shows that are still on the air, like Finding Bigfoot, Expedition Bigfoot, Mountain Monsters, Monster Quest. All of these shows are still featuring Bigfoot. And even when Bigfoot used to be reported just in the Pacific Northwest, and you're now getting reports of Bigfoot in Minnesota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, Florida Texas. Come on. <laughs> He's not going to go to Florida. It's so hot. Or Texas. It's hot. They're, With all that they, fur. And the, in Texas, it's got to be the Chupacabra, don't you think? <laughs> well, at least Chupacabra has no fur on it. Right. You know what I mean? Well, I guess he's a goat. Are you sure? Doesn't he have fur a little bit? I don't know. No, Chupacabra is goat sucker. But he oh, himself is sucker. supposed to have no fur. He's like hairless mm. with fangs. Oh, so. that's creepy. Yeah. He's like Nosferatu. Yeah. What, what's the um what's the thing that's running around Pennsylvania? What do they call it? Not the I know that you said Sasquatch, but they there, wasn't there something up in there that was running around the 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 pine barrows or something, the Jersey Devil? Is the that Jersey what Devil, that's <laughs> yeah, it. That's yeah, I don't it. know much about the Jersey Devil. I've, I've come across it a few times, but I, I don't know much about it. Episode idea. There you go. There we go. We got to go out in the field and look for these things. Um, But the thing is, if and they even report seeing him here in New Mexico now. Jesus. So, so again, it's like his range is increasing. Mm. Uh, which should be increasing our opportunities to see a Bigfoot or to come across a Bigfoot. Yeah. And and yet we still don't have any physical evidence of Mm-mm. a Bigfoot. Conclusive nope. physical evidence. Yeah. I mean, we have the videos, the photographs, uh, obviously the footprints. Uh, we have some audio screams out, out in the woods at <laughs> night. Uh, but we have no, we have no poop. We have no scat. We have no fur, no, no bones, no, no skull, mm-hmm. and we don't have a type species, meaning that yeah. we don't have a body. And 
you oh, would that's think... the technical term type species means body type species is the first one that we we find or something that is is a, a example of that species that's mm. definitive of what it is i see the first like smoking gun here it is right so like uh if you find a, a new fish new species of fish you want to type species of that fish to yeah, show people of what this is yeah so. first thing you do is kill it <laughs> so you got it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> You need that type species and nobody's you know, going to believe you. First thing you do when you discover a new species is kill one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, but it's, uh, again, if he's all over, all over the country now, you, you would think that we would, somebody would have hit him with a car by, yeah. by now. Yeah. You, you find some car, a Bigfoot carcass out on the side of the road. Oh, somewhere. yeah. He'd be hooked on fentanyl by now. I mean, you know, he's got to... <laughs> We would have crushed him. Yeah. <laughs> we would have sucked him up into our, our cancer. Yeah. Yeah. We evolved him real quick and got him hooked. And then now he's extinct. <laughs> so exactly. Like a period of like three days. <laughs> <laughs> or I, I'm even thinking like some old white guy would have shot him by now. <laughs> I think, you know, old white exactly. guys shoot, shoot anything that comes yeah. in their backyard or near their house. And yet we That's hear about all like. old white guys are good for anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Killing stuff. <laughs> Just. Keep an eye. Just sit by the dining room window and wait for a Sasquatch to come, and then yep. we'll shoot that thing. You yep. Um, and you know, I I recently drove from New Mexico out to Indiana, and I was seeing armadillos, dead armadillos, by the side of the road, all Everywhere. through Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. Wow, is that because I, now I don't remember seeing armadillos growing up in Kansas when we grew up. No, so it's got to be it's got to be the uh, the change of of the uh, of of the climate, right? The climate change, right? Exactly. And, that's, and so you're you're tying that into Sasquatch. You're saying the climate change is forcing Sasquatch to head to, <laughs> head to Florida. <laughs> I don't know. I just all I'm saying is it's it's odd. But when when a species when their uh, range expands, yeah, you think that you would start to see them more. Which is what happened to the armadillo. And yeah, I had to check it when I got home because, yeah, I'm the same way. It's like, I never saw armadillos in Kansas. No. Mm -mm. And uh, I looked online and you, they're like, yeah, in the last 25, 30 years, the range of the armadillo has gone farther north. Jesus. So, is, this, is, this, is the world about to blow up? I don't know. It's so crazy. There has to uh, be a, some sort of... Uh, mythical legend about when dead, <laughs> dead armadillos are seen everywhere. You know, they're such so weird creatures, armadillos. Yeah. Oh my God, they're weird. Um, you're an armadillo. You're an armadillo, yes. aren't you? <laughs> you, oh, you mean, what do you mean? Yeah. I'm talking about, uh, well, I actually saw the dead armadillos on the road, but you're, you went to Northwestern, aren't they? The oh, Northwestern, are, we're wildcats. Oh, but wow. we have a special day called Armadillo Day where everyone oh, okay. takes mushrooms. There was actually okay. a day set aside on the college calendar for every student person to take mushrooms. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but it was the best thing that ever happened in Northwestern. Because this was during Reagan years and they were so yeah. uptight. And then you'd see these people tripping their balls off. Wow. On mushrooms, <laughs> it's the craziest thing. It was fantastic. And the school, the school supported it. The school. I, I uh, mean, they looked the other way. Everybody, the entire yeah. campus was on mushrooms. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that was Armadillo Day. I always that thought they were the armadillos. No, I don't know how the armadillo got caught up in all of that. Yeah. Interesting. The whole thing is just crazy. Yeah. I'm sure it's canceled now. <laughs> it is after this, after we talk yeah. about it. Now they're all microdosing. But back then we were macro dosing, <laughs> damn it. Uh so we anyway, I it all of this has got me thinking that we've willed Bigfoot into existence. Like at this mm. point, it's not it doesn't even matter whether or not he physically exists. He does exist now, I think, because of I see. how we've accepted him mm. into our culture. We need him. Yeah. And it's become a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, I think, or self-fulfilling belief system in that, you know, you believe that he was there and then people start seeing him everywhere. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I always, it, it reminds me of, uh, remember how the Kilroy was here, that graffiti? Yes. <laughs> with the guy yes. with the long nose. That was like World War II, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after World War II, all through the 70s, people were, you know, you'd always, you'd be somewhere remote, like out in the middle of France or something. And, and you see somebody had written, Kilroy was here with that nose. Yeah. You know, and it was always the joke was everybody was in on it that we knew that everybody was writing Kilroy was here. But but no one ever really thought that there was a guy named Kilroy. <laughs> right. Out there, you know. Right. But but with uh Bigfoot there's a belief system and now pretty much everybody believes if somebody reports that there's a Bigfoot there's a large percentage of Bigfoot enthusiasts who will accept that that was a Bigfoot being seen. In in that area not me i'm not buying into this <clears throat> uh but you know you and i are not strangers to bigfoot no we are not this runs deep yes and in the early 2000s we did a show called bigfoot the donner party and my arrest which right was a solo performance uh, well, it was a duo performance because you introduced me. You also directed right. it and co-wrote it. And uh, in that, in that, it was called a comedic lecture where the conceit was that I was teaching a, a class, perhaps, a, a lecture yeah. based on one of our, our, our heroes, uh, Buckminster Fuller, that you turned me <laughs> on to, uh, the inventor of the geodesic dome, amongst other yeah. things. But he would give these eight-hour-long uh, lectures when he was yeah. teaching at Black Mountain College, uh, and they're just amazing. He's in this suit, and you know he's got the old lavalier. So we were like, let's do a solo show with that kind of conceit. Yeah. So I would come out yeah. in a suit with a blackboard in a podium, and I would do a lecture, yeah, uh, an hour long. But it was comedy off, and and Bigfoot, the Donner Party, and my arrest was comparing uh, Grover S. Kranz, who is a Bigfoot. Uh, uh, anthropologist, I guess. No, yeah. well, not an, yeah, anthropologist. Uh, and then George Donner, the leader of the Donner party that, you know, they all cannibalized each other and me, John Lear. <laughs> and we, we decided how all three of these main men were similar because they'd all made a series of bad mistakes. Right. And right. it was, I think yeah. it was our most popular lecture. Yeah, there was a lot for people to, there was something in there for everybody, I think. Yeah, because we did a few of these. We did like six of them. Yeah. And uh, and it, it, in LA, and then we went to New York with them. But uh, I th that one was always one that everybody loved. Yeah, yeah. And, and what was great about Grover Krantz, and, and the reason we picked up on it, is when we were putting the show together, he actually passed away. And I had yeah. seen his obituary in the LA Times. And... In, you know, Grover Krantz was a legitimate physical anthropologist. And through all through uh, the 70s on In Search Of, I had seen him talk about, they'd always go to him to talk about Bigfoot and get his thoughts about whether or not Bigfoot existed. And then I'd seen him in uh, uh, the 1980s on In Search Of, they had brought him up. And... Uh, and then he, when I was actually in grad school myself, I was talking with one of my professors had asked me what I had, had done before I'd gone back to grad school. And uh, I was telling him about our show and I mentioned Grover Krantz and he was like, Grover Krantz, I knew Grover Krantz. <laughs> he, was, he goes, Grover Krantz was my professor at Washington, Washington State University. Wow. And he, he was like, everybody loved Grover Krantz. He was a great professor, but... You know, he had that Bigfoot thing going yeah. on. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, so I, you know, to me, it's like now Grover Krantz is part of my academic lineage. You know, That's he's funny. like, it's like you have the coaching trees in the NFL or like, right. you know, martial arts. You have the master, like oh, your master studied under such and such. Grover Krantz is now part of my academic tree. You know? Amazing. So I, yeah. So I thought today we could look at Bigfoot in a little bit more depth and just kind of talk about uh, what, why people believe in Bigfoot, I think mm. is what, what we'll take a look at today or why. Excellent. And, you know, I'm not going to say I believe in Bigfoot and I'm not going to say I, I don't believe in Bigfoot, but I, I believe that, you know, you got to have evidence. 
<laughs> right. Got, I'm on a evidence. different. I'm in a different. I don't believe. I don't believe. Yeah. Okay. Because you got to, and that's why Grover S. Krantz went crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I'm sure we'll get to. Yeah. And and again, it's like I'm open to it, but you got to show me. I, I I need real evidence. Yeah. You know? It's like anything. Yeah. You, you you got. Uh, is, if it is it possible? Yes, it's possible. But yeah. until I see it, it ain't it ain't real. Right. That goes right. with a lot of facts out there. This is very yeah. apropos <laughs> to America right now. You got to prove it. Okay. <laughs> so first off, for those of you who may not know or may not be familiar with Bigfoot or Sasquatch, uh, we'll, we'll go through a quick little synopsis of who Bigfoot is or what Bigfoot Excellent. is purported to be. Uh, it's supposed to be an unknown species of bipedal primate mm-hmm. uh, or a type of up, upright walking ape like mm-hmm. us. Uh, it's supposed to be six and a half to eight feet tall, covered Lived in with hair all over its... What's Lived that? with the family for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Harry did and the Did you watch Henderson's. that show or that movie or did you? Oh, yeah. I love that movie. It's a good movie. Yeah. All right. Highly recommend. Uh, he's six and a half to eight feet tall, weighs approximately 500 to 800 pounds. Jesus. People think. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's also reported to smell very bad. Mm. <laughs> People describe the smell as a mix between feces and sweat. Mm. Ooh. Yeah, okay. which is basically how everybody smells when they go camping, in my yeah. opinion. <laughs> That's true. That is true. And, and I would say probably for most archaeologists, that's a smell you know very well if you've been out in the field or at field school. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. And also for drug addicts, we know about yeah. that smell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the end of a hard night of drinking. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of when people are like, I smelled something horrible out there in the woods. It's like, who knows what that thing was, you know? Oh, excuse me. Uh, also Bigfoot is supposed to communicate with high pitched screams. And, uh, you can find, if you go online, you could find a lot of Bigfoot researchers calling out into the woods and then recording the responses they get back. (laughs) <laughs> and I've always, I, I, it's always yeah. this. <laughs> that's the part I, that doesn't make sense why would he talk like that there's yeah. no that's ridiculous yeah i've always thought that that was another group of bigfoot researchers out in the woods <laughs> who are like, just communicating to each other like did you that's hear that? did you hear that, that is yeah. the, the the ultimate example of the echo chamber <laughs> and uh but mostly bigfoot's known by of course the big footprints Yes. And the footprints are human-like. They're 14 inches long, usually, uh, very wide, mm-hmm. and the toes are all about the same length, and there is no arch on the foot. Yes. It's just a very flat foot. Very similar to anyone's drawing of a foot <laughs> if asked to draw a foot on a piece of paper. I was going to say without the arch, that's very similar. That might be my dad out there. <laughs> my dad had really flat feet. Uh, so our friend no Carlos, arch. who gave us a very, uh, a very oh, yeah. good review of our show, yeah. uh, also has big slabs of meat <laughs> uh, for feet. Uh, now, when you search online for Bigfoot, you will find a lot of books about Bigfoot. Hell yeah! And. And most of the time, they're written from a point of view of somebody who believes in Bigfoot or Mm -hmm. thinks that they have evidence of Bigfoot. You will also find one of the books I found very interesting was this book called Yeti Love. Oh, my God. (laughs) How did you find that? (laughs) It's it's out there. It's out there. Anonymous. You can't find who it's written by. Of course. They don't want you to know. It's a coloring book. And it's all full of like really ripped Bigfoots with really hot women. Jesus. <laughs> what the hell? Oh my. A coloring book. That yeah. is a mash of so many different. I, I My brain is about to explode over that. Yeah. The coloring yeah. book. Okay. Somebody drawing hot pictures of a. Okay. That's crazy. Well, he doesn't even look like Bigfoot there. He's got yeah, skin. I, yeah. I that think just he looks shaved like a little a, bit. Yeah, who's the who's the actor who plays uh, Aquaman? Oh yeah, Jason Momoa. 
Hey, that's Jason who Wilbur. he looks like there, that yeah. picture. How about this one? Oh my god. Yeah, see <laughs> he's ripped. You can see his abs. I know. I know. There's I don't get it. a four hundred page long book. How about there's one you're my talking about? God, so many. There you go. That's yeah. Bigfoot with a girl, yeah. with a human woman who's naked. Yeah. Jesus, what is wrong with us? <laughs> what is wrong with us? That, for some reason, that really disturbs me. You know what disturbs me? Is the fact that it's a coloring book. That's yeah. the part that disturbs me the most. Porn I can deal I, with, but why Why release it in that format? Yeah. yeah. That's so weird. Yeah. God, is that weird. And funny <laughs> as hell. 400 pages. 400 pages. It's like, you know what? It's like Los Angeles. It's disturbing, chaotic, but God damn, I'm happy it exists. <laughs> I think, you know, I can't figure out, is this, is it someone who, a woman who's really into Bigfoots? No, I don't. Or really? is it a man who sees himself as a Bigfoot who wants to have sex with really hot women? Yeah, you're right. Because it's not explicit sex. It's very romantic. No. It's almost like the covers of, of, of those books that people read. Right, uh, right. Romance. Romance novels. novels, yeah. But instead of a, a, a whoever, it's uh, of Fabio. It's Bigfoot. instead of Fabio. It's Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. That is the. I met Fabio once, by the way. Did you spent the night with him in a strip club? Really? Yes, I was working on a movie called Eddie, starring yeah. uh, Whoopi Goldberg, and it was a bunch of basketball players because the basketball players were all on strike, so they they yeah. got all these great. Uh, sorry, uh, and. The, and and the, and the, the Tyson. This was back when Tyson was fighting. There was a Tyson yeah. fight, and the movie rented out a strip joint for uh, for all of the basketball players to go watch it. Isn't that the craziest thing? Yeah, and we that is to go crazy. watch the Tyson yeah. fight in a strip joint, no strippers. Uh, with uh, Fabio was in the movie, so he was there. <laughs> so, so it was a strip club without strippers. That's what's uh, crazy. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, did you did you talk to him? Was he a nice guy or was he? Yeah, you know, he, I don't know if he was nice. I guess he was. He was Fabio. I mean, I didn't have any problems with him. He was yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Those uh, the Yeti love. You could substitute Fabio in there. Maybe they did. Yep. Maybe they just. Took Fabio out of some romance covers in there. That's what it looks, <laughs> what like, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, so as far as hypotheses as to what Bigfoot may actually be, we've said uh, already that maybe an unknown species of bipedal ape. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some people who also say that Bigfoot is a descendant of Gigantopithecus, uh, which is a giant ape that lived in Southeast Asia about two million to three hundred thousand years ago, he's a, that he and he, and he's then also the abominable snowman. We think it could be a giant. Uh, is that what, uh, anyway? Or a cousin, a cousin of it. They think the the abominable snowman. Uh, their similarities, but he's a little bit different. So maybe maybe it is the same. I mean, if it were the same species, maybe there would be uh, some variation in that species. <clears throat> uh. But the thing is, you know, when we discovered Gigantopithecus was back in 1935 in China, and the anthropologist or archaeologist had gone into a, um, he had gone into, he was in China, he went into a traditional apothecary, and they were selling things called dinosaur bones. And he was looking at them, and they looked like very large ape teeth. And that's what got him looking around for it. And since then, we've found a lot of Gigantopithecus jaws and teeth. And, amazing. Yeah. That's and an amazing recent, story. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And because he was just like, that looks, that doesn't look like, like a lizard. What, what, you know, what the hell is that? What's thing? that doing and, here? Yeah. And I think they just did uh, a couple weeks ago. They did some DNA work on Gigantopithecus and realized that Gigantopithecus is actually related to modern uh, orangutans. Really? So, yeah. So he probably moved a little bit like an orangutan or, you know. So, again, it's like, well, if we're saying Bigfoot, Bigfoot's supposed to move pretty quickly, which I don't see how that would be. Yeah. I don't. 
By the way, uh, hmm. my dog looks like an orangutan sometimes. I, think. I call him an orangutan. <laughs> really? Yeah. Go get him. Go get him. <laughs> Put him up to the girl. camera. I don't know where he is. He's somewhere around here. What's he doing? He, uh, is he walking on he, two legs? Well, or is he... <laughs> he's a golden retriever mix. Yeah. But when I get him on his back and he's looking up at me, he's got the fringe coming off of his legs okay, and it looks like, yeah. and he's kind of yellowish and I just call him a, yeah. You know, that's, anyway, that's how I refer to him as a young, you little orangutan. Yeah. Yeah. What was it, that he, movie with Clint Eastwood? Where, oh, where, yeah. where he, every which way but loose, he had yeah. that orangutan. And, right turn, boom. Yeah. He hit somebody. <laughs> Clyde. 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 Right turn, Clyde. Jesus. Yeah, maybe you, you and Earl can go with those things. I can't believe nobody got their face pulled off. Because <laughs> that's what those creatures do. They pull your face off. We've talked about this. Yeah, yeah. And you think I'm kidding. Like, I'm not, that's, I'm saying, I'm very literally, they pull your face off. Yeah. Why do There's they always... always pull people's faces off? You hear about that know. a lot. They just, our face freaks them out. It's it's their face and the genitals. They always pull the genitals off. The genitals well. and the face. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, Ooh, I'm not. A, yeah, <laughs> think about that next time you want one as a pet. God. We still we have to do one a, a episode on people who have raised chimps as as oh, human babies. That's fine by me, but we're not going out in the field for that one. I'm not going over to oh, your no. house. I don't want to be no. near one of those things. Wear a cup. Wear a cup if we do that. And a face, you know, a just... hockey mask, <laughs> hockey mask, and a cup <laughs> you over me your a pants. Cup and a hockey mask. I'll go in. I'll go in and interview him. Go in and have a beer and smoke a cigarette with him because that's what they love. <laughs> they all love to smoke. <laughs> uh, other people claim that Bigfoot is an extraterrestrial or interdimensional being uh, because Bigfoot sightings are supposed to coincide with UFO sightings. Yeah. Yeah, that's because the same <laughs> drunk guy was out looking at both of them. <laughs> well, you know, even Grover Krantz in his book, uh, he talks about the lunatic fringe. <laughs> he would say, I know. Like, everybody would contact him all the time and you want to talk me to, about I have his book somewhere. Do you still have a copy? I yeah, I have a copy somewhere. I have his his book Look right at that. here. Big footprints. There it is. Big footprints. Uh later released as Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence, the anthropologist speaks out. Jesus. And then you know what? He also wrote Only a Dog. Which is which is which is which is a What's book. It? It's a memoir about his relationship with his Irish wolfhound, also named Clyde. Aww. Remarkably, yeah, he, it's a great book. Doctor Kranz, lovely, Grant's, lovely he, book. He, he, he kind of he went he went south hmm. on us towards the end there. <laughs> uh, and probably the most famous Bigfoot evidence that we have is the Patterson film. Jesus. And I think you know the Patterson film. I sure it's the one do. everybody everybody always references the Patterson film. Yeah. It's the like the, the zipper. Yeah, it's like the Zapruder film of a big Bigfoot. Film. <laughs> Big Yeah, films. where he's running, he stops, he looks at the camera, and then he keeps running or something like that. Right. Right. And over the past 50 years, there's been a lot of people who have analyzed that film. <laughs> a lot of people. And some people are saying, yeah, it's conclusive. Some people are saying, no, it's obviously a hoax. And ultimately, it's just another piece of visual evidence to me. And we still don't have a, an actual body. Right. And, I, you know, I won't say, I don't know. I don't want to get into it because you can go down a, a wormhole where people are like, yeah, but what, what about this? Or, yeah, but look mm -hmm. how it's walking. Yeah, but, you know. Well, like any conspiracy and, theory, that's what happens. Yeah. And the thing is, though, Patterson had written it, it, it all happened in 1967 in Northern California. Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin were both walking uh, or both out on horses and they were looking for a Bigfoot mm -hmm. at the time. There you go. <clears throat> and then remarkably, they also had a fur suit in their saddle. <laughs> well, they they also saw. Patterson had written a book about Bigfoot the year before, and he oh, was man. set to go on tour to promote his book. Uh -huh. He just needed something to lift it off. Yeah. And I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying I wasn't I there. Am. I don't know. I'm <laughs> saying it. <laughs> I'm keeping an open mind. You could say it. He had, a, he had a 16 millimeter camera in one saddlebag and a suit that yeah. fit his buddy Rob in the other. <laughs> Rod, just, what were they? Roger and, and Robert? Roger and Robert. Yeah. 
Robert, put it on. And it's just odd to me. Like, what are the odds, statistically, that you've written a book about Bigfoot, you're going out looking for a Bigfoot, and you see it. I mean, all these TV shows that we have on have no Bigfoot footage. Yeah, Yeah. zero percent chance. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, the other thing, they both had rifles, but yeah. apparently they had decided before they went out, if they saw one, mm. they wouldn't shoot it. Yeah. An <laughs> eight like... foot, 500 pound thing <laughs> running high speeds. Yeah, yeah. I'd be firing away. <laughs> I'd be galloping and firing. Yeah. And screaming. Like John Wayne. John Wayne and Rooster <laughs> Cogburn. Like two rifles going after that thing. Yeah. And it's screaming. And you know what, what I'd be screaming? Those high pitched sounds that you heard in the recording. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yeah. You know, I. Because I grew up around hunters, you know what I mean? And I know when you get excited, you're out, you know, and something pops up. People Everybody shoot shoots. at anything. That's Everybody how shoots. they all get shot. Everybody yeah. gets shot. There's a famous bar in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, where they have this little shelf that go in around the bar. And yeah. when I was in there drinking uh, years and years ago, and there was a reflective hunter's cap, a few of them in a row yeah. on, the, on the thing. And I said, what are those? Oh, those are hunting injuries. Those are people who've been (laughs) shot. Each time a hunter gets shot, we put a reflective hat up there. And he says, by the end of the season, deer season, the whole whole goes all the way around the bar. (laughs) You know, my mom shot my brother in a hunting accident. It's a famous, famous story. It's one of my favorite stories. Shot his toes off. That and, and your, uh, what do you call it? Your birth your birthmark on your butt of Ireland. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. Scot- is it Scotland or Ireland? It's Ireland. Uh, but uh, she shot your brother's toes off. Yeah, in an accident. And the same day when they took my brother in, they were like, oh, McCray, were you in here this morning? It was the same day my uncle had shot my cousin. I didn't <laughs> so, know that. Yeah, yeah. I've known you for what, 40 years yeah. and I'm just learning that? That's yeah. fantastic. I just love like, the because your mother was so sweet. Yeah. And I just love the idea of her <laughs> shooting her son's oh. toes off. Oh my God. Devastated so her. Devastated. Devastated. Her. And he would take yeah. it off, right? Every Mother's Day and show him. Yeah, yeah. Like a, just yeah. let her know. It's still yeah. there. God. Uh but but again, you just see that like that's why ha- you get enough scotch in people and get rifles and guns and everybody sh- i think i'm the only mccray that was never shot that's amazing. actually and thank god they had all quit hunting by the time i, I came <laughs> up you know the family had broken apart but i i was like uh I'm, I'm still a little nervous like you know <laughs> the odds are statistically i'm going to get shot at that's some true point. mccrays yeah. have a hundred percent chance of getting shot <laughs> Uh, but anyway, Grover Krantz was one of the guys who analyzed uh, the Patterson film and felt that it was authentic. Okay. He said he had talked to Patterson. He had talked to Gimlin. And what he said was that Patterson, yeah, when he, he, he was expecting, yeah, if it was a hoax, Patterson would have an answer to all the film problems. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, he said Patterson was always able to come up with you know, some excuse for why, why the film was the way it was. But he said the one thing when he talk about um, the actual creature and how the creature walked and the propulsion of a biped, he said that it was kind of out of uh, Patterson was out of his his depth. You know, so this is what kills me about Grover S. Krantz, because it's the same thing with Cripplefoot, which I'm sure you're going to bring up soon. But he attributed all of this knowledge to this evidence. And there's nothing to back it up, but how does that work psychologically? You're a scientist yeah. who knows stuff, but yeah. yet one guy is telling you a story and that's enough to sway you completely. Right. It's right. unbelievable what the human yeah. brain can do. Because he wanted, when you so badly want to believe something, right? you can right. justify it no matter, it's amazing. Yeah. And I think if if people give you a hard time about it, even as a scientist, there's a part of you that wants to prove it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, do you want to? He wrote something in his book about uh, about possible hoaxes. Yeah, and, that's uh, true. 
<laughs> you, can I throw it over to you to read yes, that? Yes, I would that. be honored to read this. This is from uh, Bigfoot, Big Footprints by Grover Krantz. He writes, A standing bear <laughs> could be mistaken for a Sasquatch, provided the observer did not see the bear's protruding muzzle, narrow shoulders, or short legs. It is similarly possible that an observed Sasquatch was assumed to be a standing bear. An oddly shaped tree stump or rock formation could be mistaken for a Sasquatch <laughs> if they were only briefly glimpsed. The observation may indeed be of a bipedal primate, a man dressed in furs and viewed under circumstances that did, that did not permit a clear estimate of size. This could be just coincidence, or else the man in furs was deliberately costumed to get the desired effect. Anyone attempting this is risking his life. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a fantastic quote. Yeah, yeah. You see how even he knew, like, if you go out there in the woods and a... a I think that's a warning to other like yeah. possible Bigfoot hoaxers. It's like you're yeah. going to get shot out there. You're going and you know to who's going to shoot him is Grover S. Kranz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is this does, is this middle initial S? It's uh, S. I keep, yeah. Okay, good. Because I keep calling him that. I just yeah. love that, you know, or the opposite could be true. Yeah, yeah. It could be you think you're looking at a bear and it might be a Sasquatch. It's yeah. like, yes, everything is everything. It yeah. could be a potato. It could be. <laughs> but it's it's very, uh, I don't know, he's very authoritarian. Like, I love Grover yeah, Krantz. Like, me I, too. I'm a, a very sympathetic for Grover Krantz. Me too. I have a lot of respect he, for relate, Grover Krantz. And I relate to him. I yeah. relate to the human side of him big time. Because yeah. I am Grover Krantz. We all have a Grover S. Krantz inside us. Yeah. All of us. Yeah. And I've read, you know, I've read, preparing for this, I read, like, his other academic articles and stuff. And, and like, he's legit. Like, he was, like, a lot of stuff was really good. He always, um, you know, people would disagree with it for certain things. But, I mean, that's all part of the process, the peer-reviewed process. But, exactly. but, yeah, I have a lot of a lot of respect for him. But I'm also very sympathetic for Grover. Trump. Oh, I have so much empathy for him because, I, you know, he... He's creating, without knowing it, a prison of his own making. Yeah. And and I can so relate to that. It's such a human thing. It, yeah. Yeah. The it's, wish, um, the hope is so high yeah. that we end up just buying in. Yeah. No, overlooking and, and other overlooking things. Overlooking everything yeah. that we've been trained to do. Everything. Yeah. Like people look at the election or all of these things, all of the, I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. You want it so badly. Um, there's another anthropologist uh, named David Dangling who uh -huh. also reviewed, <laughs> who also reviewed uh, the Patterson film and says it's a complete hoax in in Dangling's. Uh, yeah, Dangling, opinion. Dangling, <laughs> shut up! It's, it's students. Where's Dangling? Sure everybody, I don't know. He's looking at his film. <laughs> uh. One of the things that Bigfoot supporters always say about the Patterson film is it, it couldn't be hoax because the, the creature is walking with a compliant gait and that humans don't walk that way. And Unless they're is, really hot and sweaty in a, <laughs> with big boots on yeah. and a fur, you know? Well, Dangling is, is even more, his answer is simpler than that. He's like, do you ever watch a, a, a Marx Brothers movie? And it's like Groucho Marx walks with a compliant gait. You bend Every your hip and you bend does. your knees. Yeah. Every comedian does because he made it, it that's a part. It's like it's like knowing Yiddish. Yeah. If you're a comedian and you don't know Yiddish and you don't know how to walk like Groucho, what the <laughs> hell are you doing with your life? Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's like well, no, people people can't do that. It's like, yeah, we all can do that, you know, yeah. compliant again. We just have to do it. We have to be compliant. Yeah. By the way, I had a professor in grad school who would give us uh, every year would give us um, extra credit if we would walk like a primate down the hallway. That's great. <laughs> yeah. What a great professor. I love that. Yeah. It was so fantastic to be like in a group of 15 people all walking. Like I, I would usually do the given. You know. <laughs> yeah, you went full on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> I would have done this for free, prof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extra credit. 
<laughs> when do you want us to stop? Should we start throwing poop at each other too? <laughs> uh, and again, you mentioned already, besides the Patterson film, the one piece of evidence which uh, Grover Kranz said <clears throat> really persuaded him yeah. uh, was a footprint that he called, these are his words, not mine, cripple foot. Very famous. Yeah. And what he thought, he said he had studied a lot of footprints and he, he could always tell, <laughs> he could always tell that when they were fakes. And uh, he hubris. also did a lot. See, that's the part of him I can relate to, the hubris. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, know, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And in his book, he's very detailed about like what a footprint actually does when you're walking in dirt. Right. <clears throat> and he said, you know, there was something unique about Cripplefoot, and that is it portrayed a foot injury. Yeah. It was a footprint that with like the pinky toe mm. was off to the side. Yeah. It looked like, yeah. you know, they, the creature had broken its foot. Right. And he's like, there's no way <laughs> anybody could fake yeah. that because it's anatomically correct. Right. Exactly. This is how a broken foot on yeah. an eight foot 700 pound creature <laughs> that didn't heal would look and there's yeah. no way anybody could fake it right and he said like the possibilities you know there are some Zero. people who could could do it but they're all academics and the chances of them hoaxing that would would are you know next to nothing and even that's very difficult <clears throat> Because yeah. you have to, you know, just mechanically to do it. You can, we can put a man on the moon, <laughs> but yeah. the possibility of faking a footprint, no. Yeah, yeah. And as we saw in the in the hoax episode, the Piltdown episode, there are academics that are willing to go out. Yes, and hoax uh, hoax other academics. My partner is smartly referencing a previous <clears throat> podcast yeah. of our season, so please go back and check that out. Right, the Piltdown uh, man. He also said, Krantz, uh, Grover Krantz said that there were two things about footprints that he didn't reveal to the public. He didn't and that never let anybody know, but there were two things. It's that like he the knew. cops when they keep a secret thing from a serial yeah. killer. Yeah. yeah. And he said uh, that Cripplefoot had those two things in it. And that's why he yeah, thought it was an authentic, authentic footprint. But again, without knowing what made the footprint... Uh, we have no idea if that was hoaxed or not, you know? Well, we we have a good, uh, don't we have a, there's a, because there were some people out there that later were discovered who were doing, making footprints out there. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of people. And, and usually, you know, Grover Krantz, his thing was like, I can tell if they just have a fake, a wood piece of plywood that they're just <laughs> setting it down. But Hoaxers are smart, man. Hoaxers are always one step ahead of all of us. That's you know right. what I mean? Because it's fun <clears throat> as hell to freak people yeah. out. We love confusing people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and so ultimately what Dangling says is... Dangling. <laughs> there's, Sorry. There's a ton of evidence for Bigfoot, a mountain of evidence. The problem is that none of it, none of the evidence is any good. Right. So again... He's basically saying, yeah, we have all these films. We have, you know, we find some hair, but sometimes we analyze it and the hair is from another animal or sometimes the hair is synthetic. We still need that body. You need the body. You got to <clears throat> kill one. Yeah. And and I get it that it can be really frustrating for people who want proof or want Bigfoot to exist. I yeah. get it. Me you too. Know. And... But the thing is, if if you want it to be scientific, then anthropology is a science and biology is a science. And again, you have to submit whatever evidence you have to the scientific method. And part of that scientific method is letting other people look at your research. Yes. And your research needs to be repeatable, you know. Yes. And so, you know, in their book, how to Think About Weird Things, which is a great book. Uh, Theodore Schick and Louis Vaughn describe the scientific method and it says that they say that it has four steps. We observe something, which would mm. be like, you know, observing a Bigfoot. Right. Or what we think is a Bigfoot. Then you induce a general hypothesis or possible explanation for what you've observed. 
there's a big hairy thing running around right. the forest that How could possibly be related to us. Right. And then you just deduce specific things from your hypothesis. If that's the case, he would he would have poo. He would right. he would build a, a campsite. <laughs> he would right. he would uh, yeah yeah all of these yeah. things. We'd see carcasses of things he'd eaten and fruit and right. teeth marks and all of those things. Right. And then we test the hypothesis by checking out the deduced implications. Let's so then you have to repeat fruit. it. Yeah, yeah, you have to oh. repeat it. Uh huh. And, and Schick and Lewis say that the goal of the scientific in inquiry is to identify principles that are both explanatory and mm -hmm. predictive. Yes. And just collecting data without a hypothesis that you are trying to test means that we are just ending up with a lot of data. Yes. And that's kind of what we had. I, th I think even ghosts, which we're going to do an episode on ghosts eventually, oh, too. I have no doubt. <clears throat> But again, it's the same thing. Is it's like you can have a lot of footage of yep. something, but yep. if you want it to be scientifically proven, taken seriously, yeah, yeah, you have to come up with some sort of hypothesis that can be tested and proved. Exactly. So, In, if, for example, if <clears throat> uh, there's a bunch of uh, your your you know bunch of things being said on the internet. Yeah. About a topic. Yeah. That's just data. And you've got to be able to prove it in another way. You've got right. to be able to corroborate it. Yeah. And, and you, you have, have a to... hypothesis <clears throat> of how it happened. And then you have to prove that hypothesis. Right. But if you and just you have, have to... a bunch of hearsay evidence, no one's going to take it seriously. Yeah. It's and just it may data. be true. There may be a Sasquatch. There may be, you know, some of these things, but until they are proven, we cannot yeah. take it seriously. Yeah. And whatever the data is or the hypothesis you come up with, you have to submit that to other experts and let yes. them test it because it yes. has to be repeatable. Yes. And, you know, one of the reasons why we submit it for peer review is so that we don't fall for bogus claims. Yes. And a good example of that was, remember in 1989, there were some scientists in Utah who said that they had come up with cold fusion. They were able to uh, yes. produce energy through cold fusion. And Which instead would have changed of, everything. Yeah. And instead of submitting their experiment, you know, or their, their data, their research to peer review, they immediately went to public media. Yeah. And the media just went crazy with it. Like, oh my God, they've created, you know, cold fusion. They've done cold fusion. And when experts finally started looking at it, other scientists, they were like, there's something off about this. Yeah. It's not, it's not right. And sure enough, come to find out they hadn't done cold fusion. No. So again, that's yeah. uh, why you want to have other people, you know, other scientists look at your work and, and, test it themselves and see if they get the same result you did. Mm -hmm. And usually what we do from a scientific standpoint is if, you know, a hypothesis that's constantly found to be true repeatedly yes. is called a theory. Yes. And, and usually that's creates a confusion for the public because the public always thinks about a theory as being, they use theory in, interchangeably with hypothesis. Yes. Yes. You know, and thus but conspiracy to, theory, the actual right. term conspiracy theory. Right. And but to a scientist, a theory is a hypothesis that has been repeatedly tested and repeatedly holds true. And then you. Tr so the theory is kind of the story, the proposed story of why all of these hypotheses, right. uh, hypothesis, hypothesis, right. see, are coming <laughs> are, are Hypotheses, I think. Uh, hypotheses are all yeah. being proven. What's right. the theory? Why is this always happening over and over and over and over? Yeah. There must be a and thing called gravity. I right. have a theory that there's a, a force called gravity. Right. And most, and that's interesting that you mentioned that because I know a lot of scientists or, you know, anthropology teachers, science teachers will say, yeah, up to this point, the theory of gravity, based on what we know right now. Yeah. The theory of gravity says that when I drop my keys, they will fall to the ground. Yes. But I still keep an open mind that 
I may do it a thousand times, but on a thousand and one, there still might be a possibility that those keys fly off into the sky. Right. Because scientists, but, that's how they have to think. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, so it kind of, you know, when you talk about like, ah, oh, scientists don't want to believe anything. Scientists don't want to believe what's out there. It's like, no, I, I find that hard. Scientists do want to believe. But they want to know. <laughs> they yeah. want to know that it's tested. You know what yes. I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and it's hard to think about scientists who, you know, these are scientists have split the atom or unraveled DNA. It's hard to say that, oh, they don't want to believe anything. They don't right. want to know, you know. I think it takes a, a lot of belief to constantly show up in a lab and keep testing yeah. hypotheses. Absolutely. A lot of faith. A lot yeah. of faith. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the problem for when it comes to Bigfoot is, you know, a lot of people are more familiar with pseudoscience than they are with actual science. Yeah. And, you know, this includes students as well as the public. And I would say probably even there are probably even scientists who are, you know, more drawn to pseudoscience. And yeah. it, why is because pseudoscience is great. There's more drama in pseudoscience. Yeah. You know? It's fun. Yeah. It's great for movies and TV shows. <laughs> and you get, yeah. You know, you get to go on, on, you know, be a guest on something. Um, and I will say, like, reading Big Footprints by Go Grover Krantz, and we've kind of touched upon it, is there are times where I feel like he's running through problems with his argument or, you know, and it's it's kind of like in, in TV writing. What's the term like um, running through the bees? Isn't that uh -huh. what they say? Or, yes. You know, yes. where there's a problem in your script, like stuff yeah. isn't lining up, but you're just going to write through it real quickly and hope people don't notice. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you'll find like a beat that's not working and you're just like, oh, just keep going. They will. Yeah. 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 Wait and I a find minute. That... What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I find that in his book and I, I completely get, but it's, and you mentioned it, a lot of the stuff he says are where nobody would ever try to hoax that. Nobody would ever try to fool yeah. somebody. And it's, there are people that would try to fool. Exactly. Fool and more. that's why these ho these scientists sometimes get pulled into pseudoscience. Yeah. We were saying, and you, and you get that a lot. Well, you know, like um, uh, vaccinations causing, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, autism. Yeah. Autism. So yeah. that all tracks back. And my understanding is that all tracks back to one study. Uh, and yeah. there were like, I don't know, there were like, say, a dozen uh, uh, scientists involved in that study. All 11 of them have rescinded that yeah. theory, except for one. But then you have that one that you could. What about the doctor, PhD? Yeah. And you say yeah. his credits. You're like, and you're like, yes, but that's just one. Uh, that's yeah. one piece but until right. it's proven, until you have a lot of people repeating it over and over and over, it, you just can't accept that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's... Um, but the fact is, is that these scientists fall into it. They're human like us. For yeah. whatever reason, whatever reason, Grover S. Krantz, even though he was this amazing anthropologist, amazing guy, something pulled him into Bigfoot. Something. Yeah. And yeah. now the fact that this, this, and he slipped, he slipped. Yeah. Because I think, uh, once again, you know, there's nothing worse than spending years working on a scientific problem. Yeah. And then having Funny the evidence come true. up. Yeah. yeah. Something's off or you made a mistake. It's hard. It's I hard. I hear them. I've yeah. developed TV shows. <laughs> That have taken me years. And then I go out yeah. and pitch it. Nobody buys it. It's yeah. terrible. Yeah. But that's true. That's the way it is. Yeah. I, I hate getting notes from TV executives. When, oh. when I would get TV notes, there's nothing oh. worse. But it's like, nothing. you got to take it. Yeah, it's part of the job. the job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in his obituary, it was interesting that one of his colleagues said that, quote, he was a person who liked to take on controversial issues in his own field of physical uh, anthropology. And he was willing to look at things that other people in this field wouldn't look at. He wrote an early paper on the influence of language on human evolution that was way ahead of its time. He said he liked to take on an underdog hypothesis oh boy. and make it credible. Yes. And of course, the Sasquatch hypothesis is an underdog.
is the ultimate underdog. Yeah. 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 I guess that's where he got, you know, he got the hubris. I'm the guy I'm here's right. my, here's my <laughs> version of me. I'm the guy who takes hypotheses that yeah. are hard to prove and I prove them. Right. And I could get, it's fun. It's fun. But then it's, it's like, it's begins to creep into everything else. Yeah. And then and, at and the, the end, right, he's driving around trying to kill Sasquatch, right? Yeah, yeah. He had finally, I mean, first of all, it's, the book is, is re, he's quite aware of how people interpret him. Yeah. From yeah, from a from an ap- academic standpoint. Yeah. And, which is amazing to me, because there's a self-awareness. And he's like, you know, he goes in, he talks about, you know, it was hard for him to get tenure. He think may, maybe the, the Sasquatch research <laughs> yeah, kept him from getting tenure. Uh, he also says that, you know, uh, he spent a lot of his own money, you know, they, they had set up a, uh, um, didn't his marriage break up over it or, didn't I, I they, think they... One, but then he also met his wife through one of his articles about Sasquatch. Yeah. He met somebody who yeah. bought into his. Yeah. yeah. And there's a, there's a photo in the book of him, like in a, uh, like ultralight helicopter, like sitting on the ground. And I'm like, and he's talking about how, how he's going to, you know, he had bought it himself because no one would ever Jesus. donate any money for all of this stuff. Nobody would donate any money to his research. So it was all out of pocket. Oh, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. That's a great idea. That'd be quiet yeah. and everything. And then you read where like, there was some flaw in the design and it never got off the ground. Right. <laughs> was, Boy, you, know, you don't so. want to get in those things. You ever been yeah. up close to one of those yeah. things? It's like a, a lawnmower uh, oh, yeah. engine strapped to a <laughs> kite. It's the craziest thing. Don't go yeah. in those. Uh. And so, again, it's it's revealing that he says in the book, quote, it was never my intention to become a leading academic authority on the Sasquatch, and I'm not particularly comfortable with the position, Yeah. unquote. So, yeah. very fascinating guy. Oh. Um, so, like you say, John, at the end, he was, he was driving around. He knew that he had to get that uh, type specimen. Yeah, he had to get a body. Yeah. And, and so, here's and so, this, like, decorate, you know, this heavily educated... PhD, spending the end, the last yeah. days of his life driving around with a gun, yeah. trying to shoot yeah. a mythical being. Yeah. <laughs> I can so relate to that. Me too. Me too. Uh, I, mean, I, I just, get I'm, it. yeah. It's like, it's like, a, I'll show you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, but there's also a component to it that's so beautiful because it's a dream. It's a, it's a, yeah. you know, you're out there trying something that nobody else is doing. I mean, but there's yeah, hubris yeah. attached to it too. It's just, it's very complicated. It's very human. Right. It, it, right. It's yeah. It's such a modern man story, you know? Yeah. It's uh, he does talk about how there's no laws against shooting a, <laughs> what's a right now is an imaginary cr- creature you know so he's like yeah you could shoot that maybe after we kill the first one there will be laws that will will protect it but right now he's like game's on you know yeah. i mean we can all you, you he's can like shoot i've it. gotten all the evidence i can get i need i need to shoot him and chop his head off yeah yeah and Bring i like where he he talks about how you know with practice he goes into detail about it. he says with practice he was able to drive around out in the country and in the woods at 25 miles an hour, then stop the car, set the brakes, turn on the extra lights, pick up and load the gun, and be standing at point outside the car in about 15 seconds. Oh, that just <laughs> breaks my heart. Because that's where the the insanity has crept yeah. all the way in. Yeah. That's, and that he, just breaks my heart. Yeah. That, and he says, you know, that he, he, this old man is rehearsing that over and over yeah. and over. Oh. Yeah. And he says, you know, you have to know what you're looking for because he once saw uh, what looked like a, a Bigfoot out in the woods. <laughs> oh, boy. But uh, he said that he could tell by the stature it was shorter than what a Bigfoot was. And it was somebody in a hoodie. Oh, boy. Can you imagine? As, as if there's yes. not enough danger to be wearing a hoodie anywhere now. Jesus. You might have a Don't wear Bigfoot. a hoodie out in the woods all alone. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> But, but, you know, that's like those, and, and my God, what a tragic end to his life would that have been? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, and, and you know, you hear about people uh, in their old age, you know, just tragically killing their spouse yeah. or something where it's yeah. just, oh my God, my wife yeah. has this story of the guy dropping off his wife at the, 
you know, he was in his nineties. He shouldn't have been driving. He drops her off at the hair salon. She comes out. He accidentally runs over her and then backs up back oh. with her oh. and just kills his wife at the end of it. It's just so tragic. Oh. Just to live so long. And then. But, 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 but Grover S. Kranz practicing that stance and the ability to get his yeah. gun going, you know, you, he was right. It could have easily ended yeah. with him killing somebody. Yeah. Um, <sighs> This week, did you see in Germany, there was, uh, they were reporting outside of Berlin that somebody had spotted a, an escaped lioness and they had video footage of it from a cell phone. And when I first saw it, when I looked at the footage, I was like, oh my God, that's a lioness. And, and then they had experts look at it and they had already sent out the police, cl schools were closed, everything. And when an expert looked at it, he was like, that's, that's a boar. And he was showing pictures compared to what a, a, a boar looks like uh -huh. leaning down and what a lioness would do. Wow. And sure enough, like once you saw an expert detail it, you were like, that's not a lioness. That, that's something else, you know? Well, but I would say, are boars really dangerous? Like they'll char, boars are like, yeah. like don't, they, don't yeah. we have big problems in America with wild boars and you have to put yeah. armor on the dogs to go chase them down and shoot them. And they're hard. To, so yeah, yeah. In in Europe too, it's bad. I guess in Rome, they're uh, like rats. Rome and Germany. Yeah. Uh. So anyway, just concluding, I'll I'll just say that um, in 1893, there was a guy named uh, Frederick Jackson Turner. He was a historian, and he wrote like a really famous uh, essay about the frontier. And how important the concept of the frontier was to Americans mm -hmm. and how Americans had always identified themselves in relation to the frontier. Yes. And what he was writing about in 1893 was he was lamenting the fact that we had already expanded all the way across the continent to, yeah, the, Pacific, to the Pacific. And there was no longer a frontier for us to mm -hmm. um, use to, to base who we That's were. That's easily accessible. Right, right. Right. And in an essay called Cryptozoology in the Medieval and Modern Worlds, Peter Dendel says that. Eh, Dendel. <laughs> You're one of those two. <laughs> uh, Peter Dendel says that maybe these mythical beasts, such as Bigfoot, allow us to find ourselves at the very threshold of the wilderness once more, often from the comfort of our home. And in other words, maybe we need Bigfoot to be seen yes. in Florida and Ohio and Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. because seeing him there is a way for us to still confront that unknown and dangerous yes. frontier. So, because the real unknown, the real frontier is within us now. Yeah. It's going inside yeah. us, you know, and that, yeah. you know, and, and really, you know, uh, and that's why we're going to, you know, invent, you know, chips to put in our brain <laughs> and yeah. we're all going to become digitized energy. Yeah. And oh. that's why we have this podcast to look at our belly button, to look within yeah. the final frontier is inside us. It's yeah. Raquel Welsh and that little miniature spaceship. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that movie was great. Oh yeah. God, yeah. she was amazing. Remember they come out the eye at the end. Remember oh, was that? that through the tear Fantastic duct, voice? right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. they're in the eyeballs, you know, splashing yeah. around. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> chat, chat GPT is going to miniaturize us. We already are. See, this is just a simulation <laughs> that we've created. Yeah. Oh, God. I, All right. I have lots of hypothesi. Okay. Well, that's what – maybe we'll save that for one. Then you could uh, – <laughs> open mic. You could just go. You could just go. <laughs> All right, John. I think we've – this is wonderful. I think, hope we've come up with something. I mean, this is our again, best. I, this is a, a fantastic hmm. episode. You, I just want to applaud you. You put a lot oh, of work you. into this and oh. it, I just love it. I just, Grover S. Krantz is one of my heroes. He's just, both yeah. of, you turned me on to him and I'm just so, oh my God, I just relate yeah. to him. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I would say his book is the good thing about his book. I mean, whether or not you believe in his arguments for Bigfoot, but it really, he has an insight and awareness about 
the whole academic research into Bigfoot and about yes. the Bigfoot community. Like I said, I, people had convinced him, like somebody convinced him to go to an art gallery in San Francisco that was doing an exhibit on feet. Mm-hmm. And they said, why don't you take your cast of Cripple Foot and it'd be great exposure because you'll, oh, uh, you'll get to go down there and there'll be people with money and they'll want to donate to you. And it's just one of those things where he goes down there and he's like, nobody contacted him afterwards. No one yeah. donated any money to it. Yeah. And they just and, laughed at him. Yeah. As, as an anthropologist, as a scientist, as a artist, as a human being, yes. uh, you have to feel compassion for somebody yes. like that. So. Yes. We've all had that, that, that horrific failure. <laughs> right, that, that right, right, right. Nobody exactly. gives a shit about what yeah. we think. Everything uh, you've de- devoted everything, your life. Yeah. To. Oh. Yeah. All right. If you have enjoyed this podcast and find it interesting, uh, please tell a friend about it. Yes. Or perhaps host an intro to anthro listening party. And I love that. And send us photos of your listening party. I'm envisioning, John, I'm envisioning like like uh, Franklin Roosevelt's Fireside Jazz, <laughs> like a whole family sitting around listening to the podcast. That's what I'm thinking. Dressed up. Um, they were all dressed up, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. FDR thing. So wear your finest. I was thinking, too, we could we should put together, uh, <laughs> have them available, uh, Intro to Anthro with Two Humans uh, listening kits. And we'll have like a bald wig and a gray wig, and then people can, you know, just. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> or better yet, we'll do a uh, a Yeti love convention in Las oh. Vegas. Oh God, that would be. Well, that one's gonna be video. We gotta video everybody. I don't know who's gonna show up to that. We'll try to post some uh, some photos of the Yeti love uh, coloring. Oh yeah. Mug. Yeah, uh, so you can get a look at that. But if you watch, if you're watching us on YouTube, you've already seen it. Right. I think we need to. Them. We should color them and then frame them, and then that'd be our giveaway. If somebody, yeah. if we use a topic, if we I use love topic, that. Then. I love yeah. that. That's like our <laughs> headshot that we send out. That's fantastic. But they're detailed. It's going to take a long oh, time yeah. to color them. Oh, it's not a crap, small I job. Don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we can't do that in an afternoon. Oh. Do you think those I mean, were done by once, hand, or we made? I do. We made a uh, a bean portrait of a friend of yeah. ours for his wedding. Did yeah. not go over well. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's a collector's item now. I'm sure. It was, yeah, I don't. I wonder where yeah. that is. But it was a it, it was a a huge framed portrait of he and his bride to be made out of yeah. beans, and yeah. um, that took a long time. Yeah, it was like an emergency thing. I always thought that that was like a. a a, a fire axe in a glass yes. case because if you, you were ever meal. broke yeah if you were ever right. broke you could eat that thing yeah right put them in soak them <laughs> boil them up and eat them yeah yeah it's always there like you always, always i always there. got one last meal always and in the meantime it's a nice piece of art yeah all right thank you john thank you everyone for joining thank us you. we appreciate this, it so appreciate it. this is human number two And this is human number one, John McCrae. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you again. Thanks. Bye.